In this chapter, we'll be discussing facilitating group learning. So the objectives for this chapter is to be able to explain the stages of group development, list the factors influencing group cohesiveness, differentiate between formal and informal groups, identify the characteristics of group and team dynamics, describe the roles and responsibilities of a group leader or facilitator, describe the roles and functions of both the facilitator and participants, and lastly, discuss the suggestions for promoting group change and develop skill by leading a small group discussion. So let's define groups and teams. So again, we're looking at small groups, so groups consisting of three to 15 people who share a common purpose and who feel a sense of belonging to the group and who exert influence on one another. So I think the most obvious group for most of y'all, of course, is the core that you're in. So I'll probably be using a lot of class examples because again, when we talk about having a purpose for the group, a sense of belonging, the different roles you play, I think you'll be able to see all of this behavior, especially as you've seen each other grow throughout the program, as well as in the prerequisite classes. So again, you're in a formal group. So this is established by the organizational structure and by management, or in this case, right, your upper level would be, this is determined by the fact that you're in a cohort in an academic setting that doesn't change. So again, you don't really have control over it. You've chosen to come to school, but you're placed in the cohort in the group, and it is what it is, and then this is the group moving forward. On the flip side, some of you have also established informal groups. And so these develop because of the interest of the group members and often to fulfill social needs. And so what I can see then is during break times, during meal breaks, after class, you can see pockets of somewhere between four, occasionally more, up to six. Sometimes it's fewer than two or three students. Um, but again, you're talking about specific topics. And so again, whether this just be common interest, whether it just be kids, whether this just be food, right? And just having uh, someone to talk to while eating. But again, there's also the informal groups where, again, you're free to leave. You're not forced to continue to stay with your classmates, but you choose to in an informal group. All right, so the first stage of group development is forming. So this is when the group first forms. So this is the period of getting acquainted. And so serious issues, controversies, and conflicts are avoided. And so what this is, is this is when the group first gets together and everybody wants to make a good impression and I don't know any of these people. So this was probably in your prereqs for most of you, right? Because you kind of move through the prereqs together. For some of you, this was the first nutrition class in food, right? So that foods class where you're first in the lab, where again, you kind of establish and trying to figure out what's my role, who's the cool kid, who are my classmates, who's the loud one, who are the quiet ones. And we don't really want to make anybody nervous, so we're kind of more reserved and we're not really being our full selves. Next, you have storming. And so this is as the group begins to move forward and start to learn more about each other, conflicts develop. And so again, the facilitator, or in this case, the teacher, is going to encourage sharing of views and opinions. And so again, what you're going to see is that a directive approach toward decision making and what's going to be established as acceptable group behaviors. So as you noticed, as you got more acquainted with each other, probably into maybe the, the, maybe the end of the first class, but really into the second and third classes, you know, you kind of start to have those conflicts of, is somebody asking too many questions? Is somebody dominating conversations? Does nobody else let me talk or answer questions? And so on and so forth. And so there start to be conflicts within the group. Now, what should happen, right, is then is that the teacher, in this case, for your group, right, is allowing calling on different students, allowing different students to talk. But what may be needed is a directive approach, right, when it comes to finding out how do we come to a consensus or what do groups agree on, that may require more of the facilitator or the, in this case, the teacher's role rather than the group or AKA the class itself coming up with the answer. And then finally looking at norming. So again, this might've happened maybe the third or fourth class where again, we went from we were all super nice. We then kind of had our conflicts and then we should have right worked it out and come to an understanding. So members are now accepting of the ideas of others, goals and plans are agreed upon. 
and again, the group is now being productive. You're getting projects done, you're studying together, you're coming up with group decisions, we're going to do things like this, and so on and so forth. Or in this case, if you were in a work group, right, this is the plan that we're going to come up with, or this is the solution that the group is going to come up with. And again, it's not so much the facilitator or the person who's having to control the group, aka the teacher, but the group itself. And then lastly, so one of the final stages is going to be performing. And so this stage is not reached by all groups or teams. And so here we have so high performance teams that work smoothly and without conflict. So again, at the norming stage, the group is still being productive and accomplishing the task. At the performing stage, though, in essence, everything is optimized. Things are working very smoothly. Everyone's being heard and listened. Everyone's coming up with a good idea. I can, that sounds good. They take, you know, this input, they can take somebody else's input, they can adjust their own and everything works smoothly and at a high performance level. So again, not reached by all teams, but again, this would be that optimal level that the group reaches where everything runs smoothly. Next, we have some vocab terms for the characteristics of group and team dynamics. So again, I would be making flashcards of these. So you have the norms, which are the accepted standards of behaviors or codes of conduct. And so again, within the group, is somebody going to arrive late? Is somebody going to talk very loudly or try and dominate the group? Uh, you know, is there in essence the class clown who needs to be corrected, so on and so forth. And so then based on that, based on the norms and what's accepted, people within the group are going to have roles, which are their learned behaviors. And so again, sometimes you have roles that are, of course, part of that formal group. So when you have the treasurer, the historian, the secretary, etc. But then you may also have roles that are informal. And so you can tell, again, who has that leadership role, right? Who's the more social role, right? So every group has a social linchpin, right? That really kind of connects the group where everyone talks to and so forth. Now, within the group, we have to worry about someone's status, which is a person's prestige, perceived importance and their influence on the group. So again, those with higher status in essence are more involved or more in the group or seen as more powerful within the group typically. And that'll tie into our next term, which is going to be power. And so that's the ability to influence others' behavior. And so typically someone with more status will also then have more power, right? So they're able to then influence other people's behaviors as well as controlling their own. And again, similarly, we have informal power, right? So everyone knows who the leader in the group is, right? This is usually that most sociable person who has high status, who everyone agrees with. But then you also have, for example, in a formal group, right? If somebody is put in charge, or for example, as an organization, if you have the president of a student dietetic association, etc., right? Then they have a formalized role that gives them the power for decision making. We also have synergy, which is the potential to produce better results as a group, which is usually the whole reason why you formed in a group setting, which is so synergy, the sum is more than the whole of its parts. So ideally by getting different perspectives, which this goes all the way back to chapter four, which is why you would want a multicultural group, right? Is you're getting more perspectives, more concepts, more ideas, so that the conclusion or the answer that you come up with is better thought out and better reasoned than if any one person did it. We also have cohesiveness. So this is the degree of attraction members of the group feel for one another. And in essence, right, it can be summed up in the terms of how much the group talks in the terms of we. So again, especially if somebody is speaking, quote unquote, for the group, if they're the formal or informal leader, and they keep saying, well, I think we should do this, or I think this. Again, we're looking at a group decision, which is how much of this was the group's decision, right? So we think this, or we are recommending this. And so again, looking at consensus, which is usually required, at least especially when you were within your small groups working on lab assignments. Again, all group members agree, they support a decision and they commit to it. And again, this is part of that usual right process where there's some compromise where we may disagree. We had that storming, we had different ideas, but we're able to work through them effectively and produce a quality product that everyone stands behind. And so looking at the guidelines for seeking consensus, You'll notice it has some similarities to the interviewing and the different types of responses. So members, of course, share their opinions. So if we were trying to reach a decision on how we want to go forward on a project, etc. And then ideally, right, so ideas are going to be paraphrased and understood. So 
group member one gives their opinion and you would do like you would in a normal interview or conversation where you want to make sure that what they're sending is clearly being decoded and the message is being received it sounds like you're saying this you think we should do this for the project again we're going to have a difference of opinion that's normal it's all about how that is resolved but again a difference of opinion and a different directions is expected and so what should happen is that as each group member is heard again we can't do every single person's idea simultaneously but the group should arrive at a solution that can satisfy everyone and again we agree can best meet the objective even though we may personally have done it differently now this core hasn't been on campus as much so i haven't gotten a chance to observe you all but one thing that we need to be careful of is groupthink um, or you may have heard echo chambers right a similar concept so here we reach consensus too quickly the group is overly cohesive or is giving in to avoid conflict and so what happens is is this is a bad thing right so it's it would seem on the surface that it's great that we come up with an idea very quickly but to actually arrive at a best decision right we need a healthy amount of debate and difference of opinion so what we don't want is a bunch of yes men just going yep yep that sounds like a good idea yep 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 just do what this person says we haven't actually talked it through or dis we haven't actually created or designed an optimal solution and so this is where the group can stifle individual creativity there's pressure for conformity and again this leads to a faulty decision right this is not the optimal decision or design for a project or solution that we can come up with so looking at group and team leadership so leadership is the ability to influence others through communication and the group process and what you'll notice then for example is that your leadership or your leader as we'll talk about has the power right so that's the ability to influence others now again we talked about the fact that there's formal and informal groups and so leaders are appointed elected emergent or shared so again in formal groups in essence the leader is going to be appointed this is the person in charge of the group they're going to be speaking for the group you have your historian your treasurer etc etc in informal groups though you'll notice that there is someone who naturally emerges as the leader in which case again that's who the group is going to defer to even if they haven't officially been given the title of leader so looking at the characteristics of an effective team so we need a leader that doesn't dominate or defer to the group or team and so what that means is the leader can't be a pushover and just do whatever the group says and on the flip side they can't only come in with their preconceived notions and opinions say this is how it's going to be and not actually listen to input from the group or team and so a leader should motivate and reinforce members behaviors that are healthy and so we'll talk about what that looks like and what facilitator skills look like in the next couple of slides and again what the leader should be encouraging and managing is that all members need to participate in the problem solving processes so again remember going back to group think we said there might be pressure on the group members where again we want to make sure there isn't undue pressure people aren't just caving in and being a bunch of yes men going yep that's a good idea and not actually sharing their opinion so we need to make sure that the leader is involving all of their participants in the problem solving process now looking at managing small groups and teams so one thing to consider is looking at diversity within small groups and teams and again this may lead to difficulties because perspectives and traditions are culturally defined so again the way you approach a problem is going to be very different for example we have individualist cultures and collectivist cultures again they approach problem solving very differently now ideally what will happen is is that you would benefit by having both perspectives and being able to come up with a superior choice or decision together as a group but if one half of the group feels like they're not able to clearly offer their opinion or their opinion won't be respected again this can create some problem and so again looking at those specific skills again remember the leader is going to serve as a facilitator again involving employees rather than prescribing to them so again not overly dominating the group and just voicing their own opinion and trying to get the group to agree with them right that's not a true leader or facilitator's role so now we'll take a look at some group facilitation skills and so the first one's going to be facilitator preparation and so again being a good facilitator you need to think about the group what they're doing what they're achieving so for example envisioning what i would like to do for our case studies is in a round table method again so everyone has equal input everyone can see every other member of the group and so facilitator preparation includes as a good facilitator changing the physical environment making sure that everyone's able to participate 
etc. You have relieving social concerns, so this is making sure how everyone's going to be tolerated in the group, people's views are going to be respected. Again, we have that etiquette or netiquette of how we expect others to behave online, for example, in our Zoom meetings. We have tolerating silence, which is if you're asking people to actually think about something, to make discussions about difficult topics, to come up with solutions to difficult problems, is that there is going to be some silence. And we don't want to try and rush through that or fill the silence or it's uncomfortable. Um, and again, it's finding that way to be patient. This is with all counseling actually as well. Again, there's an appropriate or healthy amount of silence. Again, guiding unobtrusively and encouraging interaction. So again, as the facilitator, the conversation needs to continue to flow. Again, trying to keep the group on task. So again, we're trying to talk, for example, through our case studies and then reinforcing the multi-sided nature of discussion. So again, asking open-ended questions, getting multiple viewpoints, making sure that groupthink and just a bunch of yes-men aren't okaying the first idea that pops into everyone's head. And again, this stays a quality, multi-sided discussion. Controlling overly talkative participants. Again, you may have one or two people that are going to talk most frequently. And again, depending on the scenario, so I know with online it's a little bit different, people have a lot going on. But if we're in a classroom, for example, we want to make sure that everyone is participating and that we don't have one or two people dominating the conversation. This is encouraging silent members. So for those that are not talking too much and are having the opposite problem, making sure that their viewpoints are heard and participating in the conversation. Halting side conversation, which again, so it should be discussed with the group, not two group members discussing things off to the side, which can be very distracting. Discouraging wisecracks. So again, especially when you're looking at the struggle for status and power, again, an appropriate level of interaction, and again, I'm not allowing people to be off task or have inappropriate remarks, helping the group stay on topic. So again, we don't want to stray from the task at hand. And again, all of this while still staying neutral and avoiding the facilitator's preferences, where again, as a good leader, I'm not trying to just get you to agree with me, but again, reach your own conclusion as a group. Now, in addition to the facilitator skills, there's actually skills that both the facilitator and the participants should be able to function or use. And so the facilitator, though, may need to reinforce verbally the functions all participants are expected to perform. So again, setting it clear, right, these expectations that the group members will have. And so this list, I know it's a little small on the slides. This is on page 401. And so, for example, um, and again, these may be unofficial, what you'll find is that people fall into these roles, which is the clarifier. So clarifies what was said, adds examples, illustrations, or explanations. Whereas someone like the orienter clarifies the group's purpose or goal. So you'll always have, well, remember guys, this is what we're trying to accomplish, right? So people will kind of naturally fall into these roles based on their preferences, based on their previous experiences with leadership, etc. Now we also have the paradox of group dynamics. And so again, the reason why we think this is beneficial and why we're trying to encourage this is that there's the potential for creative thinking and problem solving. So again, especially with multicultural groups, we'll get multiple viewpoints, multiple solutions. And so then at the end, our decision or solution will be a superior product, right? We'll actually come up with something that is better. But using a group may actually stifle creative thinking. So again, we talked about somebody who's overly talkative or we have a facilitator who's not staying neutral. Right, then we can actually stifle creative thinking and we can have an inferior outcome or product. And so again, a good quality leader is going to facilitate positive behavior and inhibit negative behavior. Now looking at some specific techniques for problem solving and decision making. So we have brainstorming, which is a group method for stimulating creati creativity in problem solving. And so again, you're probably familiar with brainstorming, which is everyone we just shout out, although it should be a little bit more organized than that, but it's just everything that comes to mind, every possible solution. So we're looking at quality, not quantity. Now that being said, to make sure that everyone gets represented equally, their ideas are heard and things are fair, we can use what's known as a nominal group process. And so this can be done individually or in small groups. And so what this does is this is in essence silent brainstorming where again, you don't have to worry about someone interrupting you or someone using the same thought as you or you not getting a turn because you're afraid your idea won't be received well. Um, but again, we would write these down on paper 
and then begin sharing them. And then we would then take a look at all of the different ideas and vote on which ones to focus on. And so this can be an advantage for those who have difficulty organizing their thoughts. Again, with brainstorming, you just have everyone shouting everything out at once. Here we're doing things a little bit more methodically and again with a little bit more uh, silence and then focusing again. We're still getting good volume and quantity, but hopefully we're going to get better quality. And we also have what's known as focus groups. And so this is a qualitative approach for eliciting perceptions of 5 to 15 people. And we use open-ended questions for them to explore. And so focus groups are done, for example, when they created the MyPlate and they had a focus group of different ages, genders, ethnicities. And again, they asked them, what does this look like to you? What does this say to you? Are you able to do this? Or what does this impression on you? And so they're, you know, how user friendly is this? Or does the plate hold any meaning? And so on and so forth. Where again, we're trying to evaluate just how people would look at this. And if they say this, then we make changes. Do they prefer this one or this one and why? And so on and so forth. And you can actually read there, you can download the transcripts where these tools are evaluated. So for example, I actually did for a research project, I looked at the transcript for the My Pyramid. So not the Food Guide Pyramid and not the My Plate, but the, the sideways pyramid in between, where again, the focus group actually said they preferred the pyramid shape because of familiarity with the old Food Guide Pyramid. So that they actually admitted in the focus group that it wasn't a very useful tool, but that it looked familiar and they liked that comfortability. So those are the kinds of information you can get from focus groups. And so looking at meetings as a function of group dynamics. So again, we talked about these groups and how they're formal or informal or how they might come together. We talked about the class being a group. You also have meetings though. So these are again, defined groups at work. And again, they have a specific purpose, which is to share information, discuss information or take action. So as a company or as a unit within that company, etc. Now that being said, to be a quality meeting, it should have an agenda. So what we're going to be talking about, specific goals that will be achieved by the end of the meeting, and again, within a specific time frame. And so again, we talked about looking at those leaders, their ability to influence their power. And so again, leaders empower members to contribute and manage conflicts. And so thank, thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions.